Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I hope you can all hear at the back. Is that okay? okay good. Um, sorry? Is that better? Okay, I'll, I'll try with that. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to talk about the Layers of London project. Um, I think that there are some interesting connections with um, the projects we've just heard about, and I hope we might talk about some of those um, over questions later. Um, so, yeah, so what, what is the Layers of London project? Some of you may have come across it, and I wanted to see people here actually worked on it. I don't know how you got in, but... Uh, um, so, essentially, it's a, a large website, digital resource about London from the Romans to the present day, and it includes a lot of digitised content, including maps and historic data um, from some of our partners, and I'll talk about some of those later. But also, I think, critically, um, for today's purpose, in a way, is the involvement of... Um, members of the public, schools, community groups through crowdsourcing and georeferencing. So a number of local projects across London's boroughs. And then finally, the idea is that we act as a kind of hub for um, London history, providing toolkits and resources for people to use. So what do we actually want to do? Um, so we want to try and uncover, record and of course share the multiple histories of London. So I think some interesting synergies there with the, the Citizen Atlas project in terms of those multiple strands of history and in a sense future looking as well. Um, and in doing so we want to sort of encourage and enable projects. We can't work closely with every single project, we want to sort of catalyse and stimulate those sorts of local initiatives across London. And um, rather as we heard earlier we want to try and preserve and share sort of heritage that's um, either disappeared or it's about to disappear. So the urgency of projects relating to HS2, Crossrail and so on are really important to us. And then also we want to provide access to some of these resources I was talking about, such as maps and, and data sets and so on, many of which have never been sort of seen online before, others are very difficult to get hold of, um, but all are important sort of heritage assets for all of us who live, work uh, or study in London. And then finally, we want to establish the Layers of London website as a platform for other people to use. So we work with, already with a number of projects, academic projects, local heritage projects, um, who, are, who are providing content for us to put on the website. So, I mean, the context, in a sense, has been already outlined. It's a city that's rapidly changing, um, its people are changing, its environment's changing, and that, of course, has an impact on heritage in many different ways. And the other changes that are particularly important for our project are the technological changes. And one of the, the questions the HLF, who are our main funder, ask every applicant is, why do this project now? And one of the answers to that is that the technology is at a point where we can use it in an accessible, often free way. Um, that's much easier to do now than it was, say, 10 or 20 years ago. And then finally, um, the availability of these maps and data sources that I was talking about earlier. The partners who have reached a sort of point in their own sort of institutional development where they want to share their maps, their digital assets with, with, with the public and with, with, with projects such as ours. So we've been uh, running since uh, the middle of 2016. We had a pilot project funded by the HLF uh, over just over a year. Uh, where we focus on the borough of Barking and Dagenham for our pilot. But the main phase of the project started uh, in January 2018, so just over a year ago. And we're working with a range of uh, wonderful partners, um, including Museum of London Archaeology, Historic England, London Metropolitan Archives, the National Archives and the British Library, um, but including also um, organisations which are not, strictly speaking, formal partners, um, but the National Library of Scotland, for example, has come on board very recently with some of its wonderful wonderful maps. But we're based at the Institute of Historical Research, which some of you will know is based in Senate House, just around the corner. But I want to say a little bit about the origins of the project, because it sort of came out um, of work that um, I and other colleagues did a few years ago on early modern London, and you heard that I'm, I'm an early modern historian. Um, and one, we run a series of projects that were looking at the way in which London developed and was transformed in the period of roughly 1500 to 1750. So from a population of around 100,000 to a population of 
well over half a million getting on for 700,000, 800,000, that sort of level. And the physical environment of London was completely transformed um, through urbanisation of the suburbs in particular. So we had lots of questions about what the impact of that, all, all those changes was on things like families, households and so on. Um, but as part of those projects, we of course realised that the physical environment and uh, maps were, were incredibly important to understanding those changes. So as part of our work, we um, developed two sort of sub-projects which took two different maps, one of which was William Morgan's map of 1682, and the other was John Roke's map of 1746. And we established a partnership with Museum of London Archaeology, who have a wonderful geomatics team, which many of you may know and have worked with, and they geo-referenced both of these maps. Um, and they geo-referenced it in a very sophisticated way, which I'm only going to begin to uh, understand and, and talk to you about uh, this evening, but essentially involving taking many thousands of points on those maps that can be connected to points on uh, in real-world geography, so to speak. And that's represented on the right by that graphic, which divides uh, the map into the original sheets. Of course, all these maps were published in single sheets that um, were meant to be sort of joined together, but never were sort of in practice, if you like. So the task for MOLA was to um, do that geo-referencing and also stitch those sheets together so that it, it, it looks like a single image. So the result is the map you can see in the top left, which is John Roke's map. And as you can see, it's very slightly sort of distorted or warped um, because of the way in which the surveying was done in that period. And so um, there's a very, really interesting blog you can find about this process of geo-referencing. I encourage you to all to have a look at it. Um, but one of the conclusions was that um, surveyors like John Roke, who you can see at the top of a church tower there, used church towers as um, key triangulation points for their survey. So the further out you go from London, the fewer church towers there are. So the less accurate the surveying is. So that's why you get the distortion that we saw out here, for example. And then what Mola have also done, um, which again will be appearing in the Les of London project in due course, that they've digitized all the information on those maps. So every street name, every place, everything <laughs> on these maps has been uh, digitized in the form of either a point or a polygon, a shape. So we have all the streets, networks for these two maps, and all the places, all the buildings that are mentioned have been created as, as digital polygons. And that's so you can then attach information about those buildings, those people, to those points or polygons. So we're effectively creating a GIS of early modern London using these two maps. So it's an incredible amount of data that has been created through these projects. So, for example, you can see the um, streets on the eastern fringe of the city around sort of Aldgate and Whitechapel, as they were in 1682. And then by 1746, you can see that the, the network starting to expand further outwards. But also, really interestingly and crucially, there's lots of infilling going on um, in the, between, between the streets that were there in the 1680s. So it's a really interesting insight into urbanisation in that crucial period. So one of the projects we ran um, as part of all this was a project called Locating London's Past, which is a collaboration between um, ourselves, I was then based at the IHR, um, uh, Bob Shoemaker at Sheffield and Tim Hitchcock, who was then at the University of uh, Hertfordshire. And it's called Locating London's Past. And some of you may have come across this. Um, it was a very experimental kind of project. It was done very quickly. There's lots of problems with it, but it was a way of testing some of the methodologies that um, we, we've now come to use with Layers of London, particularly the geo-referencing, but also being able to interrogate historic data sets and display those on a map. So there's lots of geocoding went on with data from various sources, including taxation information from the 17th century, and crucially here, the Old Bailey Online, which again, many of you will know is a wonderful resource. So we ran a, a geocoder that picked out all the places mentioned in the Old Bailey. 
Um, so this query, for example, shows the locations of pickpocketing offences recorded in the Old Bailey, which um, unsurprisingly perhaps shows that they occurred along main streets. Um, but it's an interesting you know, way to visualise data of that kind. So now I want to move on uh, sort of properly, if you like, to the Layers of London project. And some of you will know the, the home page um, from uh, seeing it online. Um, here is our sort of main um, mapping page, which shows the maps on the right-hand side and some of the collections on the left-hand side. So we're going to be, well, we are using various types of content on the site. Um, and you can see those here. Um, it's organized using a, a scheme of records and collections. So you create records, and then you can um, upload them as part of a collection of records on a particular topic or about a particular place. And those um, collections can be owned by individuals or shared between, t between teams. So you can work with a number of people. And then finally, um, there are the layers which give the project its name, which I'm going to talk about in a bit of detail um, now, just to show you what we've got so far. And there are a number of reasons for um, having these layers. First of all, they sort of provide um, some context for uh, the information people are uploading. That's really important, I think, as a way of um, allowing people to reflect on the London they are looking at. So, 19th century London or 17th century London, so they're not sort of writing their records in a vacuum. They have something to sort of bounce off, if you like. They have some context. They have uh, a visualisation of London as it was in the period that they're, that they're studying. So that, 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 that's the, says the main reason for having, having those layers. But of course, the maps are very interesting in themselves. And I want to say a bit about that when we go through and look at each, each of the maps we've got in a moment. So, so far on the website, we have um, eight historic maps, and these have all been digitized and georeferenced in the same way that we georeferenced uh, the Roque and the Morgan maps I talked about earlier. And they range in, in time period from the early 16th century right through um, to the middle of the 20th century. And we have a couple of maps to come, which I'll talk about later. We also have two sets of ordnance survey uh, maps from the late 19th century, but also some fantastic maps from the 1940s to 60s, which are incredibly detailed and have great information, for example, on the usage of industrial buildings and that kind of information. And the graphic on the right just shows them all sort of piled up on top of each other. So this first map is, is the earliest we have so far. Um, it's a map that's a, a composite map um, developed by the Historic Towns Trust. Um, and it shows London in about 1520. And it was published originally in an Atlas, Historic Towns Atlas of London, back in the late 80s. Um, last year, the HTT published a fold-out map, and at the same time, we, they worked with us to, to give us a digital version of that map, so, which you can see here. And it's a fascinating depiction of the um, religious houses, the guilds, the parish churches, um, and the sort of the the extent of urbanization in that period. Um, I think interestingly and sort of crucially, it builds on lots of the recent archeological work. So particularly um, to the north um, east of the city where there's important um, excavations on, on religious house um, complexes. So it's a really up to date uh, sense of what we know about London in the early 16th century. Then um, we've got a a pre-Great um, Fire map, effectively, because it was surveyed in the 1640s, even though it was only published, um, or actually it was published just before the fire in 1658. Um, this is Faithorn and Newcourt's uh, map of the city. Um, and it shows the um, development, particularly to uh, the west of the city of London itself. Um, but I think what's particularly sort of interesting about it is that it's, it combines an earlier way of drawing maps, which is a sort of a bird's eye view approach. So you get these sort of 3D impressions of houses 
with surveying. So actually, it's quite an acutely surveyed map, but it still gives you a bird's eye view of the city of London. And we were quite surprised how good the georeferencing worked out as, um, if you go back to, to here. So, I mean, on this view, you can see uh, Guildhall just here, uh, the Draper's Company Gardens, a nice sort of heart-shaped uh, design there, and then the Royal Exchange just above Cornhill down there. So some of the buildings are recognisable and distinctive, while others are very sort of generic, box-shaped houses, for example. So, but I think studying it quite closely, you can get a sense of how, how the map maker interpreted and presented the, the built environment. Uh, and then moving on through, this is um, a post-fire map, um, Ogilby and Morgan's map of 1676, if you can't quite see the captions, I hadn't realised it, you couldn't quite see them there. Um, so this is really quite a sort of contained map of the city rather than anything much, much larger. Um, so compared with William Morgan's map, for example, which is much broader in scope, covering the west of the city, but also Southwark, which is a really important um, addition there. And again, you can sort of see the wavy line, which represents how it was uh, geo-referenced. And then an absolutely sort of spectacular map, I think one of the best we've got in a way, is Richard Horwood's plan of the 1790s. This is the first edition of his plan, which shows incredible detail. And the plan was deliberately meant to show individual houses, individual buildings. And you can see the detail at uh, the bottom right uh, of the plan. And again, it just shows the extent of the development, particularly in sort of South Marylebone um, and the area sort of to the north of the Royal Parks in particular. And this is uh, the Greenwoods map from the uh, 1820s. Again, a beautiful, a beautiful map. Um, the detail I've shown is in North Brixton, which is gradually becoming more urbanised in the early 19th century. But again, showing sort of, you know, the Regent's Park becoming developed in other areas that are being built up as well. So what we um, have done with the website is that we've allowed people, um, so finally, I should, this is um, the London bomb damage maps. This is, a, I, I pause because this has just, just come out. Um, so this week we launched the London bomb damage maps, which London Metropolitan Archives have, and which um, are a wonderful um, hand-colored map showing the distribution and severity of bombing in um, London in the Second World War. Um, so again, you can go and compare this with aerial photographs and with um, ordnance survey maps from the 1940s to 60s. So I mean, like, uh, you know, th there are similar sites which do this as well, but in our site, for example, you can um, bring up all the, the map layers and sort of fade them in and out. So I just thought I'd show you um, where we are now, we're in that field uh, to the uh, east of Tottenham Court Road. Um, some interesting sort of that market gardening going on at the junction with Euston Road at the top. Um, and then you can see the same spot in um, the late 1790s. And what you can see there is sort of Bloomsbury is sort of creeping up. Um, Gower Street, Upper Gower Street is just being developed. Uh, those terraced houses, um, Fitzrovia, is taking shape over there, but there's still a bit of a gap, um, which is, of course, filled by the university, or London University, as it was called um, in the late 1820s, becoming the University College London in 1836. So this, is, this is a real snapshot um, of that period, uh, but again, showing how this whole area around here has been developed. So I want to just uh, focus on a couple of, you know, there, there's lots of interesting things about these maps and we could sort of talk for a, a long time about them, but I, I thought I'd focus on a couple. I mean, the first is um, William Morgan's map. Again, it's a surveyed plan, but it includes some 3D depictions of buildings. Now, what's interesting about this depiction of St. Paul's is that St. Paul's hadn't been finished. So this is an imaginary view of St. Paul's, and we think that it derives from the design on the top right, which was an early 1670s design by Christopher Wren for the top of St. Paul's, the so-called Warrant design, 
rather than the finished article, which is the bottom line. So looking at William Morgan's map, you can see lots of examples of these sort of 3D sketches of buildings that hadn't been built yet, or in the process of being rebuilt after the Great Fire. So it's a really interesting way to think about how maps um, show imagined landscapes as well as actual ones. I also want to show you this image on the left. Um, this is the Tower of London, um, as depicted by Richard Horwood in his first edition. And he's left an interesting inscription, which says, if you can't read it, um, the internal parts not distinguished being refused permission to take the survey. So he's left that for, for posterity. <laughs> um, he, also, he may also be very happy at the time, we, know, we don't know, but he um, had obviously tried to survey the tower and the, in, the internal parts of the tower, which you can see on uh, Greenwood's map, um, but had been denied permission. So he thought he'd just tell, tell people about it on his map. Um, later editions correct that, but it's unclear whether it's corrected through using other maps or whether he actually managed to get inside the tower to take a look, we don't know. But again, it's an interesting reflection on the way in which some spaces are private, some are public, and how you gain access to, to those two to map them. So uh, this is like a sort of publicity for the future. Coming soon, we have the Booth Poverty Maps, for example. Um, we're working very closely with LSE Library on these, and hopefully they'll be up uh, later, probably around the summertime this year. Um, we're also going to get, um, so about the resolution here, um, the In and Revenue Valuation Survey Maps, um, which, for those who don't know, it sounds really dull, <laughs> but they're an extraordinary set of maps, they're absolutely extraordinary. Um, essentially um, designed to value properties in terms of the, the added value that uh, public infrastructure expenditure has made um, in the early uh, 20th century. One of those taxes that never took off. <laughs> Um, but has left us with a fantastic set of maps um, linked to the field books, which you can see there, or rather not linked to the field books because of the way that the National Archives catalogues and organises them. They're a complete nightmare to navigate and get hold of. So what we're hoping to do is make that a little bit easier by digitising all the maps and creating links between the maps and the catalogue entries for the field books. We would love to be able to digitise all the field books too, but we don't have the money at the moment. So you know, one day maybe we'll do that. But that series of maps, again, we hope to, should be coming out later in the summer. Now about 800 or so of those. So that's the, those are the historic maps. Um, now, another sort of strand of our project involves the public and it involves georeferencing by the public. And we have a collection of 24,000 aerial photographs taken by the RAF in the late 1940s covering the whole of London. And we want you and also school children to georeference these for us, please. Um, so we have worked with a company called Clocan Technologies who are based in Switzerland, um, who developed a georeferencing tool for the British Library a few years ago. And they run a very successful georeferencing project um, for their map collection. So we're working with them and we're imminently launching um, the georeferencing facility, working with schools in different, in different boroughs initially. So the schools get to go first and then the public get to go after they've had a bit of a play with them. So um, this is essentially how it works. You select points uh, that appear on satellite images or OS maps and on the image itself. And then you press go and it sort of uploads it um, and again, sort of skews it, warps it like that as well. And on the right, you can see sort of the pilot project we ran a year or so ago in Barking and Dagenham. So using uh, tiling software, you end up with a single image effectively um, using all these um, maps of uh, these aerial photographs of, of Barking and Dagenham in that case. So that's just a, this is just a very sneak preview of a, of a um, a mock-up of how it's going to look in terms of being able to select a particular borough and then go and select photographs to georeference from there. And that's our sort of league table for the, for the project. So I want to say a bit about the uh, collections 
um, that we've been working with. Um, and they sort of they divide roughly into two types. Um, the first is what you might call curated collections, and that's where we've been working with partners um, such as archives and libraries to create collections um, in a kind of managed sort of way, if you like. Um, and the first of these involves the London County Council um, Photographic Archive, which is really extraordinary. Um, and we've had to um, select only a thousand, <laughs> only a thousand images from that collection um, to um, put on the website. And so we divided into a number of themes, and the first was uh, Housing London. Um, and that's been online for a little, little while now. And really, it, it's a good way of, first of all, putting a huge amount of material online at once. So we sort of feed it through the back end, if you like, rather than through um, the record creation um, project. Um, but also to provide um, really good models for how you create the records in the first place. So the excellence of the work that colleagues here have been doing is shown in the sort of the documentation, the referencing, citation, all those sorts of things that, that we, we think are important to allow people to, to rely on the quality of the, um, the work. So a, a couple of um, examples, one from um, what later became the Dickens Estate um, in London. And that's a, it's a really wonderful photograph. Um, I think the, the quality of the photographs actually is just, is just superb, really. Um, and then the second uh, from uh, the, the Western uh, Rise Estate in the late 1960s. So a huge range of images uh, covering quite a long period, um, and also but particularly focusing on the LCC's role in um, developing housing estates in particular in London. And then uh, a really interesting um, project we ran with Bexley Archives. Um, planning documents may not be the most exciting documents for many of us, but these drawings are absolutely wonderful. I mean, these are, these are drawings submitted as part of planning applications in the 1930s, 1920s to, to Bexley Council. Um, and there's a huge range of things to, to discover by, by searching through. Um, my favorite is actually a very nondescript planning application for, for a shed, and it's a shed for experimental purposes. It doesn't say what those purposes are, but it, you can speculate. Um, so just wonderful detail you can find in some of these applications, and just, just beautiful, beautiful drawings. And then a sort of a series of projects that um, essentially are um, projects that members of the public have been working on. Um, sometimes in, in sort of working with us, but sometimes sort of not, and they just, just appear on the website. So um, I'll run through a few of them. I mean, you can explore at your leisure, but just a few examples. So, um, for example, the political history of Lambeth. Um, this is actually an incredibly diverse collection. Um, and it's, sort of, it's not necessarily what you think when you, when you look at it. Um, it includes, for example, an, an attack on Lambeth Palace in 1640 by artisans and apprentices. Um, it talks about a Chartist meeting in, in Kennington in 1848. Um, and then the uh, a very sort of moving account of, uh, self-authored account of the arrest of Olive Morris in 1970 and the racist and physical abuse she suffered. So it's just, it's a really sort of eclectic and interesting collection um, that, that's been put on, on the website. And then secondly, um, this is a partnership um, with um, another Heritage Lottery funded project um, on London Jews in the First World War, looking at the history of the Jewish community, particularly in the East End, but actually all over London as well. So some interesting uh, images um, about of the soup kitchen for the Jewish poor and so on on that, on that uh, collection. Uh, and then finally, um, many of you will know the John Tallis London Street Views. We have a few images um, on the website at the moment, but hopefully more, more later. Um, Tallis, as many of you know, created a series of 88 pamphlets between 1838 and uh, 1840, um, mostly showing uh, things like um, London's main commercial streets, um, but including street histories, um, advertisements, and of course, crucially here, some of the elevation 
So it helps to sort of turn a website that's primarily a sort of a 2D website into maybe a 3D website, which photographs and uh, street views like these can, can help with. And then a, a few more just to, to show you. Um, the first of these um, reflects our interest in, in walks. Um, we run a lot of walks ourselves, actually, with some of our volunteers and, and interns. Um, and some of those are going to be uploaded to the website. But this is one which is actually a walk that was developed in the late 1970s by um, Claire Manifold as part of the Rights of Women group. So it's a really interesting idea to sort of revisit a walk that was created in a particular period about and within a particular uh, social and political movement and then to sort of replay it and re-engage with it 30 years later. So it's a really sort of interesting process to work with, with them um, because I think it helps to reflect on uh, the feminist movement of that period. Sorry to interrupt. I've just spotted a relative of mine in there. Have you? He's um, he's nearly nine foot tall. Oh, he's a big man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he's very much into the Rights of Women movement. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's very much into the Rights of Women movement. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's very much into the Rights of Women movement. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's very much into the Rights of Women movement. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's very much into the Rights of Women movement. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's very much into the Rights of Women movement. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's very much into the Rights of Women movement. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's very much into the Rights of Women movement. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's very much into the Rights of Women movement. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's very much into the Rights of Women movement. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's very much into the Rights of Women movement. Right. Yeah. Um, and he's example of the kind of project we're, we're working with. Uh, then the, the Kirkman um, images are really sort of interesting um, sketches of particularly historic buildings in sort of Croydon and, and sort of South London and Surrey. Um, and then finally, um, I sort of chose this one, the tourist views of London, because these are photographs taken by unnamed tourists um, in the early 20th century. And I think it sort of got me thinking really about um, the fact that we need to bear in mind the external perspectives on London. It's not just London by London, it's London, London by people who visited, who wrote about London from a different perspective, um, who engaged with it in a different way. So these photographs were taken in 1937, and we don't know who took them, but we know the person was from a different country. Um, they show the kind of places you'd expect, maybe, to, to see, um, but uh, with the exception of some, uh, a shot of Hoban in the bottom right. So then just uh, very briefly and almost finally, just to say that we are working very closely with schools in many parts of London, and we've developed a number of resources that schools uh, and teachers can download to use as part of uh, lessons. Um, we're connecting particularly with um, different stages of the national curriculum. So if anyone here who, who's interested in that, please get in touch with us. So I think the, um, the final message really is please get involved. Um, we want to engage with as many people as possible from different parts of London, different kinds of communities, um, academic groups, community groups, faith groups, whoever. Um, and we have a number of, way, of ways in which you can be involved. Um, we have some internships which we advertise on our website or on Twitter. Um, volunteering is crucial to what we do. So we have uh, local volunteer hubs, which we organise periodically. So please sort of turn up and learn about the project there. Or just sit at home and create records and collections for us. It would be great, be great to see more on the website. Um, but I think we're particularly interested in developing collaborations with um, projects, um, maybe Citizens Atlas and other projects that, that exist, um, looking at London in the past or even contemporary and, and in the future as well. So we're very happy to collaborate with people. That's what we're, we're, we're here for. So do sort of spread the word about us. Um, some of the things that are coming along the track in terms of the website, I've talked about the maps. We also have... Um, a trail feature so you can create a walking trail rather than just have a series of pins on the map as we have at the moment. Um, we're going to have a, a feature which allows you to comment on other people's records, um, which we think will be an interesting experiment. Um, and also the ability to add categories to pins, so high level categories such as health, housing, government, but also some sub level categories too. And this is part of the challenge of our project where you have already 6,000 records on the site, potentially 
dozens of thousands of records. So how do you find stuff on the website? So that's one of the things we're working on over the next few months. And then finally, this is who we are. Please get in touch. Um, the website address is just down here, um, but we're also on Twitter. Uh, that's our email address, bottom right-hand corner, and on Facebook too. So uh, you can't escape on online, basically. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and look forward to discussing it further.